Welcome, thanks for coming um, to this talk. So what I'm going to do today is take a slightly different approach to security with regards to what we're doing as developers, because we're not going to talk about, oh my god, I've got a library which is compromised in my production application. Uh, what I'm going to look at is a different vector of attack, but still pretty scary, and what we can do in the supply chain of our software to try to fight against malicious actors trying to yeah, extract money, information, which effectively amounts to money at the end. So quickly, my name is Louis Jacomet. I work for Gradle, um, and um, I'm a senior lead software engineer over there, and I'm currently uh, heading the what we call the support team. And so what we do at Gradle is since 2008, the mission of the company is to effectively improve developer productivity. And for that, the company has a couple of tools. So the Gradle build tool, which is a uh, build and automation tool, JVM based, written in Java, uh, fully open source, like it's an Apache 2 license. Um, and we are now about at 30 million downloads a month, uh, which is again a number. Like, because, of course, ephemeral CI tends to bring that number up, but you also have large companies that actually have a proxy for that. So, again, it's, it's an indication. It's growing, which I guess is good in one way. Um, but the reason I'm allowed kind to work on the build tool is because we have Gradle Enterprise, which is a product to help um, developer productivity engineering. So really monitoring your whole build pipeline and making sure that you're spending as little time as possible doing that. And that works with Gradle, of course, but also Maven and recently Bazel. And so if you've never tried, have a look at what the build scan is. You can flash that QR code. We have a little bit of a build speed challenge, which can, which can get you some swag. So if you're interested, um, take a look at that. That was it for the context, I would say. The reality in today's world is that supply chain attacks are no longer a hypothesis. We've seen attacks that have been targeting the tools, not even touching developers. Like The developers don't realize that what they're producing becomes infected software. Um, one of the main benefits of such attacks is the scale-out aspect by hitting a popular software, which gets then deployed to many customers, you actually have an increased attack surface just because of that effect of the software being popular. Um, and it's a difficult attack to pull off. So most of them so far have been tied to some form of nation state actor acting behind the scenes. So we're really talking about large scale stuff, but still the fact that you develop software means that potentially, through your supply chain, you could be um, a victim of these kind of attacks. So just to give you a bit of context, in 2018, so that's a pretty old, I would say, in our industry, um, there was that sea cleaner Asus fiasco, where effectively um, malicious actors hacked into the auto-update systems. They managed to install a backdoor in the software. Then the software got distributed. And the estimations are like 2.27 million downloads of the infected software. Of those, researchers estimated that 1.65 million again phoned home to the attacker's network. And what's crazy is the next number, because attackers followed up in 40 cases. So they actually infected important software because they were targeting very special targets. And they just tried to get in via the software update, but their main benefit was not large-scale um, um, attacks, but was really targeted attacks, although they used a pretty broad vector, if you want. Another story that happened with Homebrew, so Homebrew is an unofficial package manager for macOS, um, and somebody one day realized, oh, they just leaked a GitHub key on CI. Let's see what I can do with that. And in half an hour, he effectively was no one on the project, and then he had a commit on master, so effectively as part of Homebrew. He did responsible disclosure, but that again gives you an indication of what kind of things an open source project can have as in terms of attacks whenever they leak information through their setup. Um, a much scarier and more recent attack is the SolarWinds in 2020. So SolarWinds provides system management software used by big names in the world and 
including government organizations in the US. And so what hackers did was, again, introduce a backdoor in their Orion system, um, and that allowed them to effectively benefit from that backdoor on all the customers of um, SolarWinds, which got uh, the updated software. And we're talking about an attack window that goes from March to December of 2020. So effectively, for almost a full year, like three quarters of a year, the, the, the attackers were able to leverage the backdoors introduced in all the companies that got the update, and from there, again, go deeper, because you get into one network, you see what you can do in that network, and potentially, if that network is again a software supplier, you can go to the network of the customers of that software supplier. So in this case, we really see that the attack is not against individual devices or networks, but really against the distribution system, hence the supply chain aspect, and then leveraging the fan-out effect of that, um, um, of that type of attack. So we had a Java or JVM conference mostly, so what I'm going to look at now is effectively what it means in terms of JVM application building and what kind of potential at attack vectors we have. And of course, we look at different categories and we'll see that some of them apply to pretty much any project, others have higher chance to happen on open source uh, things, but if you think about it, the usage of open source in the JVM world is so pervasive that there is a chance that some of you here are actually running some slightly modified version of open source libraries because a pull request didn't make it in time, but you needed the fix, and so you end up building your own version that you use in your software, um, and things like that. So, so there is like a, a real um, uh, aspect to that, even though maybe all your code is behind closed doors. So when we think about the first step, it's effectively everything that's new code and CI infrastructure. And so clearly, you can think, and that's most important, of course, in the context of open source development, but a project gets a random pull request and it happens to upgrade a dependency. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that you, as a potential contributor to the project, may want to get that pull request locally and check it. But if you run the code, potentially that binary upgrade could be malicious. And so, of course, we're joking with Bitcoin all the things, but you have the same risk in your CI infrastructure. If you allow pull requests to be automatically built, then you, you are potentially exposed to that risk. And here, the problem is not Bitcoin here or things like that, it's actually implementing malware inside your chain. So recommendation in that context, yeah, before trying out a pull request, never try out maybe too strong, but you clearly need to look at the code first and figure out what's happening. Um, don't try it on CI, don't try it locally, just look at what's happening, and especially if the update concerns binary files or obfuscated information, just make sure what's happening and if there is like not a malicious intent behind it. And of course, you can use a number of things also because that pull request as an author, did he sign a contributor license agreement? Because then that's probably also one step in the way of doing that. Um, can you perform some background check? Oh, that's a new GitHub user created 20 minutes ago. Hmm, maybe I should check what's happening. Um, and of course, a trend in the, in the industry, which actually helps in this context, is the use of ephemeral, ephemeral CI. So the fact that your, your CI agents are effectively disposable, because then the risks, and especially the permanence of the hack, are much less. As part of identification, you can of course sign your commit. So this is something that you will see in a number of um, open source projects, just again, pro proving someone's identity. This is not perfect, but it's, it helps. Um, like we've said, the disposable containers, at the same time, they usually incur a performance cost. Gradle, the build tool, has a lot of optimizations in terms of performance that rely on having local state from previous build. If you kill the container each and every time, all of that, like, all of that help optimization just disappears. And of course, if you saw the talk from Brian Vermeer earlier this morning, um, the container itself is a risk. Because if it has one vulnerability, well, you're potentially on the platform doing what you can or what you want. 
So things that we have in terms of mitigation of these problems is, for example, on, on what we do on the Gradle side is we have a build cache. Um, that build cache is available for Maven as well as a, as a paid option. Um, and so what it does here is it allows us to reuse task outputs from previous builds without having local state. But what are we doing? We're adding one more element in the supply chain. This is a security talk. One more element means you've just increased your surface for attack. And so you need to have secure connection between nodes. Um, and also in the context of uh, uh, Gradle and Maven, for example, it doesn't deal with dependency downloads, which can also be quite a source of performance. And also, we're getting to the next section, dependencies. And because dependencies are also a pretty scary vector and not limited to open source projects. Effectively, trusting a dependency is a risk. And as usual, it doesn't mean that you can't use any dependency or should not use any dependency, but it means that you need to be aware of which ones you're using, why you're using them, and how certain can you be that they're safe. None of the package managers out there on the JVM or elsewhere will guarantee that what they offer is malware-free. And actually, we had a former colleague like look at the um, NPM advisories, and 23% of the advisories was not for bugs, security bugs. It was for intentionally malicious packages. So a package that was designed to do something bad, if used. Um, on the RubyGems repository, a couple years back, um, they effectively pulled the same Bitcoin miner from 18 different packages, from 18 versions of 11 packages themselves. And so again, the whole point there was to run code with a malicious purpose in your environment because you accidentally end up pulling one of these versions. That's something we hear often about the JavaScript world is the crazy amount of dependencies. And on average, we're talking about 80 other packages for a single dependency or single large dependency. And so, of course, we could say, yeah, you know what, I'm doing Java. It doesn't work that way. Like, we have much bigger um, um, granularity in, in, in Maven packages. Well, that's the dependency graph of a real project. Just to give you the staggering amount of a Java project, right? This is not JavaScript. This is a real Java project in a big company out there. And this is the amount of dependencies they end up pulling as part of their build. So what does that mean in terms of practical aspects? Well, in 2018, a developer, um, he's trying to do some uh, audio processing um, um, Android application. And he figures out that there is a, deep, uh, a library on GitHub that does exactly what he wants, has a thousand stars, and is available through Jitpack. And he says, oh, that's perfect. He adds that to his build runs his application, and the first thing the application does when he starts it in the emulator is ask for network access. I was like, that makes no sense. My application doesn't do network access. I just want to record voice like a memo app or something like that. It just makes no sense. He checks out and he realizes that the dependency he's pulling in is not the same as what he sees on Jitpack. And it actually contains effectively network calls to a DNS server encoding all the device information in the DNS request, so bypassing effectively most of the firewalls out there. Um, and he's like, wait, that makes no sense. And then he finally figures out that someone used the coordinates of that Jitpack dependency and pushed it to JCenter. And because of the setup of his build, his, the dependency is effectively fetched from JCenter, which appears first in his distant repositories before Jitpack. And so that's why it gets that version. In the end, they pulled it out, but still, that's, that's the kind of thing that can happen. In 2020, again, someone just went one step further. They realized that if you look at the open source repository of large organizations on GitHub, they leak some of their internal information. Like you find package names, JavaScript package names, Python package names, that are used by the application when it's built internally, but are not effectively part of the open source component. They just happen to leak in the setup of the CI environment. And he said, hey, wait, what happens if I write a small, again, DNS caller 
in JavaScript in Python, and then end up claiming all of these names in the different repositories. And that's where he got phone homes from the big names, like Apple, Google, um, Tesla, uh, and effectively raked, like, I think, more than 100,000 US dollars in um, um, bounties for effectively letting these folks know, hey, your build system is vulnerable. Because what happens is that his library executed a remote call from their infrastructure. This is remote code execution. Remote code execution through the build process. And of course, it most likely failed the build because it could not like, figure out what were the APIs and what were the behavior of these libraries. So this is not like an attack that's going to stay but it could show that it could remote code execute, like do remote code execution effectively in their infrastructure. So this means that in the projects we build, dependencies, plugins, and repositories are really, again, something that we need to take care of and be aware of the risk associated with. The good news on, our, on the Java side is that the commons, Maven Central, JCenter, even if it's like no longer um, allowing publications, but at least it's still available for resource. Um, contains millions of, of artifacts, but also have a pretty high security standard in a way, because you have the group artifact notation. Uh, Maven Central does pretty extensive check around the group, so you need to claim the domain. You need to use something that's tied to your GitHub. Like There are limitations to what you can publish over there. Uh, but still, in terms of am I getting what I think I'm getting, well, what we're using is MD5 checksums, shower checksums, both of which are not completely safe anymore, um, or signatures. And signatures are good for some things, but not for everything. So with the checksums, the problem is we're talking about integrity, but the checksums from the repo can be compromised as well. If someone manages to hack into your internal repository and changes the jar, if they know what they're doing, they will be changing the checksum files that go next to it. If you do that in Artifactory from JFrog, it's even worse. You don't even have to do it because they will serve the checksum dynamically based on the artifact. So what you need to do in that case is actually check, again, checksums from a different location. But not all libraries publish those as part of their, like their releases. Um, and also, yeah, you need to make sure that they're effectively published somewhere, like I said. And one thing we've done on the Gradle build tool side is that since Gradle 6, we actually publish a SHA-256 and a SHA-512 just to make sure that we have a higher uh, checksum and so a higher integrity check. Not only that, but Maven Central, while it has a very strong um, um, validation system now, when it started, it was much looser, and so they effectively, there are broken checksums on Maven Central. And like I said, JCenter will compute them on demand. So effectively, you have, aside from knowing that you got the file from there, you've got no integrity information there. On the signing aspect, what it guarantees is just the origin, as long as your private key didn't leak, which is also something that can happen. Um, but malicious actors can sign and they can publish their public key. And if they do that, then it's a validly signed artifact. It doesn't mean that it's safe. Also, because it uses PGP as a stack and everything, it makes it quite harder for casual developers to check. If you've ever tried to get a module out of Maven Central, and using GPG on the command line, verify that its signature is valid, this is not fun. So one thing we did on the Gradle side was effectively allow you to verify all the dependencies of your build. And so you have to configure it with an XML file. You have to tell us, do you want only checksum verification? Do you actually want um, signature verification? If you do that, you have to cover all of your dependencies, whether they're build plugins, whether they're direct and transitive dependencies of your build. Um, and yeah, as you can see, this is trusted keys. And the str at least the trusted keys can be used like for a group. So you don't have to be per artifact or per entry. 
Um, but it means that effectively every time you update a library, there is a potential broken build. Because, and it's something we investigated recently, we updated a library, build breaks. Oh, looks like the publisher just changed their signing key. Hmm, interesting. It's absolutely mentioned nowhere on their release. And so we got in touch with them because it's a requirement for publishing to Central. They're like, oh, somebody actually checks that? Oh, we had no idea. Yeah, sorry, we will add it that we effectively changed the signing key. Because otherwise, you have no reason to believe they're actually the publisher of the latest version. If somebody hacked their credentials from Event Central, that, that could be the explanation for the change of the key. Um, similar features are available in Maven, so um, you can find plugins, that's one of them. Um, that one is a bit more recent than others and effectively uh, supports Maven plugins and checking the metadata itself, uh, because that's also something that's important. Not only do you need to check the binaries you get, but also the metadata could be changed so that you actually get more dependencies. Now there is an initiative that's currently going on, uh, which is the Sixtor initiative. Um, and the idea here um, is to see whether or not we can uh, provide a safety, like a, um, a system which is better than integrity and ownership that, that is uh, given by the checksums and the signatures on, on one side. And so the idea here is that as a developer, you would create a key for signing artifacts, but that key would have a single use, if you want, like a single session. And what you do is you use that key to sign the artifact, and you also get, through an uh, open connect, uh, open ID connection, you request a certificate that associates the key with your identity. And so it gives you a stronger guarantee because you actually know that the key cannot leak, like the key will not be able to be used later on. It will only be used for the given session. Um, and what you do then is you also publish the signing certificate to a ledger, which is a permanent immutable record. And so later, when, when you're on the other side, like the consumer side, you can verify that not only you have integrity of the signature, but also you have proof of ownership of the key that created that signature. And so you know that, yeah, this is safe. Because it's one of the difficult aspects of revoking a PGP key when you realize if your key has been stolen and has been abused and you revoke it, something has been published with it already. Like, can you revoke it in the past? What does it mean? And also, if you could revoke it in the past, then you could potentially unclaim real publication. So it, it's a tricky business. So here, the idea would be to have a self-contained um, information. And of course, the goal would be to support that in both Maven and Gradle. Um, as a way to, to publish and consume from uh, repositories that would support it. The thing is, even though you're getting something from a repository, sometimes you will realize that the consistency between repositories in the Java ecosystem is not perfect. Um, there are a few artifacts here and there that have different jars in Maven Central and JCenter. Um, our own dependency verification file has sometimes excludes for signing keys or multiple checksums for a single entry. Because unfortunately, depending on how you build it, you may get a different result. And not only that, but aside from the commons like Maven Central and JCenter, um, other initiatives which are great in a way for helping developers put their code out there and be used, but have their own security challenges. So for example, GitHub has a package registry, but there is effectively, like it's something you own. So there is effectively no check then on the Maven coordinates you use inside that package reg registry. The good news is you can only read them with a token. So it's not something that can happen accidentally. Like you actually need to log in to fetch data from it. Um, but the trust you have in that package registry matters because if you read it for Kung Fu, some calculator thingy, and then suddenly they start publishing org SLF4j, SLF4j API, depending again on the ordering of the resolution, you'll get that instead. Um, Jitpack is something also that um, 
when we saw it first in the Gradle team, we're like, yes, that's very convenient, but my God, this is scary. Um, since then, they've like evolved a lot. And so you effectively have some security, like you need to have um, DNS claims in order to use uh, a custom domain name. Otherwise, it's effectively tied to the GitHub repository or the GitLab repository you're using to, to, to publish to Jitpack. But as we've seen earlier on, because there is no centralization of the claim, if you do, like, you could, someone could, if you abandon the domain, someone else could grab the domain and publish again to Maven Central. And of course, these kind of rules were not in place when the attack, if when the, the, yeah, the attack in 2018 took place, because otherwise it would have been impossible. So one of the things that we've done in Gradle for that is effectively give you the ability to filter what comes from which repository in your build. The idea being that you should really pay attention to where you're fetching your dependencies. And so here it's like a basic example. I'm taking JCenter, and I just want JUnit and Guava as my groups coming from there. Um, and I've got my own company repositories, and that's where I expect to effectively get all of my uh, um, um, dependencies from the company. Um, the Sonata types folk are here. Go talk to them about how much they know about the name of your internal packages. Because if you have Maven Central as the first repository in your, in your build and you do not use an internal artifactory, you will be requesting all of these from them. And even if you have an internal repository that mirrors Maven Central, if the mirroring doesn't have exclude rules, which you can find in both artifactory and, and Nexus, again, Every time you make a request, they will check, oh, does that exist on the mirror? And so you end up asking for coordinates. In some companies, that's leaking information and important information. So this effectively gives you the ability to know where the dependencies, avoid the leaking, and also solve some of the ordering issue. Because again, you say where something is to be found, and so there is no surprises. We usually do not recommend to use Maven Local inside a Gradle build because of reasons, documentation on the website if you want. But if you do, then please use repository content filtering so that you're only getting what you want from, from your Maven local repository. One other problem with dependencies is that as much as we would like, their life cycle does not end when it's, once it's published. First of all, you find bugs. That's one of the main reasons for having newer versions. But also, there are vulnerabilities that can be found. I mean, we've all heard about Log4Shell. That's a very good reason to update your dependency. And also, sometimes, just bad metadata is published. And a dependency brings other dependencies, which might, again, increase your um, attack surface, and you don't need them. And so that's something in Gradle that we've uh, provided in terms of um, enriching the dependency resolution graph so that you can say, oh, you know what? I'm depending on commons compress. And I know that in terms of compatibility, I never want to see a 2.0 version in my build because that could mean API changes. However, if nobody has an opinion, 119 is great. And then later on, you discover that um, well, the prefers 119 is probably too good. But later on, you discover that there, are, there is actually a CVE against Commons Compress. And you can add to your build a constraint, so it's an information that Gradle will use only if you have a hard dependency on Commons Compress. But if you have that dependency, whether it's direct or transitive, it will reject 115 to 118 because they are effectively considered vulnerable. And if Gradle can't find a solution, you fail your build. But at least you've got a broken build that you can fix by looking at the problem instead of potentially keep using a, a vulnerable dependency. Then, of course, with all of that, um, we get to um, the tooling, because we've discussed the fact that you're using CI to potentially build untrusted code. Um, you then have quite a number of dependencies in a regular application, like that's something that we all have, effectively. Um, but the tool you're using, like Gradle itself, or Maven, how safe is that? 
And so, for example, um, one thing that Gradle has for a long time and which now exists in Maven, which is the wrapper, so the idea that you do not need to have the right version of the tool installed locally, it's the project that tells, oh, I need Gradle version X or I need Maven version Y. But when you do that, it means that effectively the first thing your project does is downloading something to be executed. And so what we added recently is that you can, in your Gradle wrapper, the properties, you can provide a checksum of the distribution you're supposed to download. So that if someone tries to sneak a different distribution, different URL or things like that, that value will have to be modified as well. And again, if you see that in a pull request, pay attention, go verify, like, okay, they're bumping the version. Okay, what's the checksum of the new version? I find it on the website. Okay, it matches what I have in my Gradle wrapper properties. Okay, this looks like a safe update. Wait, it goes to a weird server and uses a checksum that I can't find. What's happening there? Investigate deeper. And of course, um, yeah, so, and so yeah, this gives you some safety when you then run the builds on, your on the different machines, like both developers and CI. Um, then we have a similar, that's for example for GitHub, um, we have a similar uh, safety, which is something that you could think about having in your own CI ecosystem, and that actually verifies that the wrapper itself, so the small jar that triggers the download of the distribution, is effectively one officially published by the Gradle project, and not again something that, aside from downloading a distribution, also does some um, um, funky stuff. Um, and here, one thing that we've tried to do also with more recent versions of Gradle is making sure that we do not regenerate that jar or that we generate it reproducibly so that effectively hits checksum does not change often. So usually when you upgrade Gradle, that information doesn't change. It, it remains pretty stable. So in that context, I need to say something about third-party distributions. Um, there's an official Gradle Docker image which was done by someone. There might have been communication with Gradle back then, but that's pretty much it. This is not published by Gradle. Uh, but for example, it's still something that's allowed to be named official. Um, we have some issues with some of the Linux distributions that really want to rebuild everything from source. The problem is, because of the bootstrap problem, because Gradle uses Gradle to build itself, um, they sometimes decide to change what they're accepting as patches versus what we've done in the project itself. And so they will publish releases of Gradle available through their package manager that actually do not match the real Gradle version. And so usually when we get report like that on GitHub where the Gradle version output does not contain the same uh, Git commit ID or things like that, we tell them, okay, folks, before we investigate anything, use an official Gradle distribution and get back to us if the problem is still there. About the tooling, if you remember, I said, oh, great, in order to, re like to um, resolve some of the performance costs associated to ephemeral CI, let's just include a remote build cache. Well, again, the build cache in Gradle itself is what? It's something that allows Gradle to not redo work that, is been done in, that has been done in the past. And so whether it's compilation or test execution, we compute all of the inputs. If they're the same, we get effectively an entry from the cache, whether it's local or remote, and we use that as the result of the task. So in the case of compilation, we will, get, we will take the inputs of the file and then fetch something from the remote cache. But if an attacker has access to your remote cache, then he could poison an entry. He could figure out what's the key for a given compilation step and replace the output in the cache directly by something that contains more. This is not something that Gradle can check. Gradle can only say, when I wrote to the cache, it's because of these inputs and it produced that output, but when it reads from the cache, it has no way of saying, wait, can I double check the output? Because that would mean effectively re-executing everything locally, defeating the purpose. And so that's one of the very annoying aspects, I would say, in this whole discussion about supply chain security, is that 
every time you put something in place, you have to think about, oh, am I increasing my attack surface? And if yes, what do I need to take into account to reduce the risks? Another approach, of course, is to think about reproducible builds. So that whenever you cut a release, it should be reproducible byte for byte. And that means that as a developer, if I cut a release on my machine, I get the same result as if I cut a release on CI, as if my colleague cuts the release. And that's also another way of giving you some sense of security, because then you can have potentially isolated environments building the release at the same time, and then you verify the integrity of what was built by comparing it. And again, right, if the attacker has full control of your network, I mean, you've been pwned differently anyway. But if something gets infected, but not the other, you'll start getting differences, and that's a reason to investigate. So this is always an ongoing battle, um, and, yeah, and a challenging one, because you need to protect everything, they need to find one flow, and then go from there. Um, of course, <laughs> the reproducibility aspect is fun. Um, the Groovy compiler had some issues in past versions where effectively the outputted bytecode differed from the same input. So that effectively like breaks you. You can't be reproducible in that case. So even the tools you're using need to be aware of that kind of objective and need to guarantee things like that. And, and then for the reproducibility, you, you've got different approaches. Um, the Apache Software Foundation really believes in sources. Um, you're technically not supposed to have any binaries in repositories, which is always an issue, for example, with the Gradle wrapper jar, because technically that's a binary. Um, and, and the trust is effectively you rebuild from source, the whole chain. But of course, you've got a bootstrapping problem because if you depend on a dependency that's not an Apache Foundation dependency, then you implicitly trust the binaries that you find on a repository. Google is a much larger company. They only have sources effectively, like it's one of the biggest single repository in the world, and building their software means building everything. But that's usually not something that most companies can afford. Um, both in terms of complexity and, 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 yeah, and scale. So, in that for me, and what matters in the context of this whole presentation, is you'll end up having to make compromise. Like, if you're a defense contractor, uh, an, a, a, um, a public organization, you probably need to have standards that are much higher than others. Um, if you're a young startup trying to get features out, you may want to take a bit more risks initially, because unless you have a business, you probably not, are not a target of such attacks. Um, and so, when, when you look at these, um, and so for example, in the context of reproducible, reproducible builds, sorry, um, the perfect solution does not exist. You really have to take into account your context and the benefits, the pros and cons of the situation. And that was it for me. Um, I'll definitely be posting the slides and I've got like a references at the back with the different articles and, uh, and stories that I mentioned. Um, and it looks like I was a bit speedy, so we have plenty of time for questions. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, hi, actually, I have a question. Is it possible to externalize all this configuration, like restriction, etc.? What you mentioned is like uh, to have single source of true and to avoid any repetition, etc. Let's say if I want to restrict uh, to use only common compressed certain version, so to avoid uh, duplications. Yeah. Um, so with the features I've showed, um, the answer is it depends because otherwise it's not fun. So the dependency verification aspect right now in Gradle is per build. So it needs to be local to the build. But it's something that we've been, like folks have asked in the community, is whether or not you could use, for example, a global company file that then all the builds reuse. Um, we don't have that feature yet. 
But that, that's something that could come. For everything that's around um, the um, repository filtering and using rich version to exclude dependencies and all of that, with the way Gradle works, it's relatively easy to put all of that into a plugin, publish that plugin, and then have all your builds consume that plugin. Okay. And so effectively, you achieve then the effect of you've got a centralized source of truth, and all the builds in the organization benefit from, the, fr from that. On the repository side, though, um, no, if, even there, you would be able to do it. it might not be immediate, but through code you could do that, yes. Okay, thanks. And I have a second question, actually. <laughs> uh, is it possible to use kind of infrastructure like PayKA, like a public infrastructure, mm -hmm. like it's done for validation, for domain validation? Let's say you can use the same private key. If, it's, if your group is matching your private key, it means it's signed by you. So if someone even is hack my account in Maven Central, so he cannot... Oh, yes, yeah. yes. So, so, so clearly, um, signing will give you that guarantee. So if somebody cracks your Maven Central publication credentials, that still doesn't mean they have your publication key. Yeah. And, and I think... I would have to check because it's been a long time since I published to Maven Central, but I believe they ask for your public key. So they themselves will, will refuse the publication by saying, okay, you've got the creds to push the artifacts, but we don't agree that the publication is valid because the, the key does not match. So I think you have key to inform domain. them. Yeah, hmm? key or domain itself is not matching, uh, because uh, I, I, uh, I no yeah. okay, I, okay sorry I see what you're saying. Uh, no, that the current system for signing um, artifacts in the in the Java ecosystem, so with with Maven Central, um, you just sign what you sign is a hash of the jar. There is no information about the GAV. Okay. So, so, you, so you, there is no link between the signature and the coordinates of the library. So you you can't do that association. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, for Gradle, it's actually the open source solution. So the question is: Is remote caching just Gradle Enterprise? For Gradle Build Tool. Um, no, like we, we have a Docker image of a cache node that you can deploy whenever you want and then configure to connect to. Um, what's in the enterprise solution is effectively cache management and replication. Okay. Okay. There's a... <laughs> Sorry, just to clarify something. You talked about using a you're publishing a, a plugin that's, that stuck your your versions or defined good versions. Yes. Uh, and you've talked about uh, verifi verifying signatures requiring a bunch of setup. Mm -hmm. Could you publish a plugin that also covered your signatures as well? Uh, for the moment, no. That's not an option. Uh, because, <laughs> again, right, it's the, 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 the problem in that context is that if you're... Um, dependency verification information lives elsewhere, then it's something that can be intercepted and potentially um, uh, manipulated. If it's next to your source code, you should see that, and, and especially in a, I mean, it's XML, but in a text form that a human can really see, oh, wait, my, my pull request or these changes, like somebody touched the file, and these changes make little sense, like they're weird. Um, while if you were to do it through a plugin, which was one of the um, um, reasons behind the design, is it looks like just a bump of a version. And you may not realize the consequences of that. And in the context of a security feature, it seemed more important that it's closer. Now, what could happen is that effectively we allow you to reference a remote file, but then it would still be just the XML file, not a plugin. So it would be like there would be a way for the for the developer to grab that file very easily b by design, because it, it would be able to just hit the same URL that Gradle would hit. But it's yeah, it's it's one of the the the, the, the difficult design decisions in security features that their annoying aspect sometimes is a feature as well. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, thank you for your time. I've got a few stickers and a couple of t-shirts left. So if you want some, be the first. <laughs>